long history in foreign policy, but what about the position kind of attracted you to it, and then how did you get involved with that? Uh, when the Red-Green Coalition started in Germany in 98, mm -hmm. uh, Joschka Fischer was then Foreign Minister, a Green, who knew me from Frankfurt, where he, in his early days, was, among others, my taxi driver. And, uh, and uh, Gerhard Schröder, who at that time was chancellor, but who was one of my successors in the youth movement, in the political youth movement, they thought they might get into troubles with the Americans. <laughs> at that time, it was Clinton, not Bush yet. And then they were looking around and thought, who could explain our policy to the United States and who could explain to us the US? So to say, if I leave all the formal description of my job aside, who could help as a translator? Mm -hmm. And uh, then they asked me to take over this job and uh, I've seen my role, especially during the difficult times of the, in the beginning of the Iraq war, uh, as a person who was explaining, tried to explain the American views against our German views mm -hmm. to the German Chancellor. And uh, I tried to explain where to him why the Bush administration didn't trust him. And I tried to explain to the American counterparts why Germans were not willing to support the Americans for the first time. Because it was for the first time that Germans say it in such a clear way, no, this is how my job started. Now it's slightly easier, but not always very easy. Hmm. Interesting. What about, I mean, what, uh what do you think it is about you that, you know, and it seems like a very difficult position to be in, right? I mean, you're in a sense defending the Germans to the United States and defending the United States to the Germans. I mean, is that something that in your past you, you seem to have in you, I mean, coming from the SDS and coming from the student youth movement and all that? I think uh, my experience, I've all my political life been dealing with foreign policy issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I discovered is, was that one problem is to get information to the top leaders. This is difficult enough. Mm -hmm. But what is even more difficult is to make them understand the information which they get. And because the top leaders, this is true for the United States, but this is also true in Germany, the top leaders in, our, in democratic societies are normally people who grew up in a domestic environment. And they have brilliant instincts in so far as domestic audiences are concerned. They go into a room, they see where the enemy is sitting, where the supporters are sitting, and they know how to mobilize certain instincts and to appeal to certain emotions. This is what you learn when you grow up in domestic policies. But interestingly enough, the same language which might help you inside the US might be, might be counterproductive inside Europe and vice versa. And therefore, if these politicians who grew up in the domestic environment read the cables, they perceive the information which they get uh, according to their domestic instincts. Mm. And therefore, the really difficult task for people who are, uh, prim are primarily dealing with foreign policy issues is not only to get the information to the top people, but to make the top leaders understand what their reactions would provoke, which type of reactions their, uh, their, their language, their actions would provoke, for example, inside the US, or which type of reaction an American would uh, provoke inside Germany. To give you one example, again, out of the uh, difficult time of the Iraq war, uh, your president at that time used the term war on terror. In Europe, war means always war on our soil. The US, if I leave the burning of Washington aside by the British in 1814 and the Civil War aside, you never were targeted in, main, in your mainland. Your wars were expeditionary wars. Therefore, you have war on poverty, war on drugs. War, when the American president used this terminology, it meant automatically that Many Europeans were thinking, 
he might start a war which might end on our soil. And therefore, Germans and other Europeans did not use the term war. And the, some Americans who I met at that time in Washington thought we were softies because we didn't use the same language. But we had terrorism in the 70s. And when I was in the 70s here in the US, I was attacked because some people in the US thought at that time our measures which we are taking against German terrorists terrorists, were a revival of German authoritarianism. <laughs> so I mean, we were very tough against these terrorists and successful, but we never used the term war on terror. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is a small example how language matters and uh, why, how many language leads to misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in translating, if you will. This is language translating, yeah. but you also have to translate actions. Yeah, and, and all these things. What do you, I mean, what is it you do to kind of keep your feelers out in the United States? I mean, you travel a lot. I mean, yeah. how, who do you keep in contact with? How do you manage this? How do you convince the Germans that, you know, this is, this is what he's facing domestically? Here is, you know, this is, uh, this is the kind of attitude you should have towards it. I'm about roughly 20% of my time I'm in the U.S. Hmm. So I'm not so often in the US and not on a permanent basis like our consulate general here. But I'm that person in the US, in the German administration, which is more often in the US mm -hmm. than anybody else sitting in Berlin. And what I did is that prior to the election of uh, pres uh, President Bush, Jr., I tried to get into contact with the neocons. Mm. And I met many of them. And uh, I told our people in Berlin that these people will have a strong importance in a future U.S. administration, and many people at that time didn't believe me. Before the last elections, about four or five years ago, I went to the South and met with promise keepers, religious right people. I attended the prayer breakfast in Washington. And I met with many people in the, with the liberal background in the U.S., and they said, these people are on the margin. They don't play any role in the U.S. politics. And I said, this is not my impression. These people are getting more and more importance, in, especially in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And they have an impact, not on every issue, but on some issues. So this is, for example, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think sometimes your role as, sort of, as not an American actually helps you see things a little clearer in that way? I mean, you can you know, not being one of the, not in one faction and not in the other, but someone coming from, from Germany. It does not only help you uh, as an outsider, which I am, to understand the US, it sometimes even helps you to understand your own country mm. better than you do otherwise. Mm. Because you start to look at your own country with different eyes. Mm. And there come uh, this, I started, when I studied, I started, as you heard, in Copenhagen, and this was in 61, and I studied history and uh, languages, and I was the first German ever who was at the Danish Institute for Occupation History. Mm. So I studied German occupation history in Denmark, mm. and I interviewed people from the resistance, and I fell in love with the daughter of a resistance fighter, that's why I got access to the files, but I also interviewed people who were part of the occupation power, SS people and so on. Mm -hmm. That's why I later on was asked to accompany witnesses at the Auschwitz trial. So I looked at, I learned as a young student to look at the country, as the history of my own country with the eyes of an occupied country, mm, with the eyes of a foreigner. Mm. And I think this is how historians and politicians should look at, they, should, they have to act, the politician has to decide. But it's also very helpful to look at, at what you are doing, what your people are doing, as an outsider. Mm -hmm. It helps you. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I mean, do you think that that's a big lack, you think, in, in United, I mean, domestic United States politics and also in foreign policy, this sort of inability to kind of look at ourselves uh, as other countries see us? I mean, is that the general sense you get sometimes? I think in general terms, it's... Uh, uh, most people dealing with, in democracies, with political issues are, are people who grew up in, in the domestic environment. So this is a general phenomenon in democracies. And because the voters are sitting at home and not abroad, mm -hmm. it means that those who are influenced by domestic sentiments and needs and interests are dominating. 
This is what you find everywhere. But because the US is a world power, it matters more what they are doing than what other countries are doing. And because the US is a continent and has so many inhabitants, therefore the likelihood that you are confronted with a need to understand the reactions of other countries and sentiments of other countries are more limited. Mm. So you have an inbuilt contradiction that the, the power of the US matters more than that of many other nations, if not of most nations, if not of any nations. At the same time, this is a country which already Tocqueville said, which is mostly rooted in domestic decisions. Mm, interesting. Um, I want to kind of maybe change topics just a little bit, but not too much. Um, one thing you write about and you speak a lot about is what you call this uh, new transatlanticism. Um, what is that and uh, what do you, what's your take on that? Already in the early 90s, I thought that the old one had gone. Why? Because the old Atlanticism was defined by the East-West conflict. Mm -hmm. At that time, the center of the conflict was in Germany, mm -hmm. right. actually in Berlin. And we were always relevant, whether we liked it or not. But we were also totally dependent. Mm -hmm. So in the first part of the last century, we were the cause of global conflicts. In the second part of the last century, we were in the center of global conflicts. Now we are in the center of a stable region. We are no longer consumers of security. We are exporters of security. Mm. And while for the last 50 years prior to the end of the Cold War, Germans were always considered to have angst. <laughs> angst that we were attacked or angst that we were defended. For objectively, it would in both cases mean the end for us. Now for the, and all German politicians had to explain why Germans had angst to Americans. After 9-11 for the first time, we were facing a situation in which Americans had angst. And the angst was related to foreign policy issues, while the angst in Germany was related to domestic issues, unemployment. We had seen a certain reversal of the role. And this had simply to do with the fact that the US were for the first time targeted on their own soil, in the capital, and in the financial capital. And Germany was, in relative terms, living in a much more stable and secure environment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we see a change, not only of the geostrategic situation, but also a change of the psychology which goes along with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are now being asked to contribute to security far away from our boundaries. There are German troops in Afghanistan, there are German troops in the southern part or offshore, the southern part of Lebanon. We have troops in, we have troops in Congo. I mean, nobody earlier on wanted mobile German armed forces after World War II. Now everybody wants German troops everywhere. So we are now asked to participate, to be more active, while after World War II everybody wanted to restrict us. Mm -hmm. At that time, everybody was concerned about German militarism. Now, people in the US press are concerned about German pacifism. So there is really a change, not only in so far as our own psychological situation and geostrategic situation is concerned, but also in so far as the perception of our role is concerned and the demand side is concerned. Mm. And we have to reformulate the transatlantic link in a changing geostrategic and psychological environment which means we have to adapt to the situation in which Germany is now, together with others, taking part in the stabilization of, uh, mm -hmm. in areas far away of German, of German boundaries. And because our values are global, our interests are limited, and our capabilities are even more limited, we cannot always say no, yes. Mm -hmm. While during the Cold War, we were more or less automatically involved, whether we liked it or not, in case of a conflict. Now we are no longer automatically involved. We have to decide. And this is a, a changing environment, and therefore the Atlantic relationship has to be redefined, otherwise it would fade away. And by modernizing it, it we uh, can keep it more relevant than otherwise. Hmm. Um, to what extent, I mean, do you think that Germany is aligned with the rest of Europe in this new transatlanticism? I mean, to what extent are, you think, Germany and France and the other continental uh, nations kind of altogether coming to this realization of new transatlanticism? And to what extent is Germany uh, maybe you know, on its own in some respects vis-a-vis -vis France and other countries? Each country is special. I mean, the US is a world power. Britain was a world power. France always wanted to be a world power. <laughs> and Germany had given up that idea with 45. 
And therefore, uh, the conditions from which we start are different. The British think they can have influence by having a special relationship with the US, whether this is really a successful concept, I leave aside. The French wanted a Europe, but it was very often a concept of France élargie, <laughs> meaning Europe, but Europe as the power base for a policy which would be defined by Paris. And Germany always, after World War II, wanted to be loved by everybody else. And therefore, we tried to minimize our power and our role and our influence. We did never talk about power, we always talked about responsibility. And uh, now we, from these different histories and from this different background, we, we are moving in direction of a convergence of European policies. And what Germans uh, want, I think, is a cross-party line, I think, more or less identical. We want a strong Europe, we, but we want a strong Europe not as a counterweight against the US, but as a weight inside the US, not a counterweight, but a weight. Why a weight? If we don't have, if we are not relevant for action, <coughs> we will not be taken serious. And I do not want to be praised in Washington because I say yes, but I want to be respected in Washington because my yes and no matters. And therefore, an individual country alone is not strong enough to matter in Washington. Therefore, we need a strong Europe, but not as a counterweight, but as a partner for the US. And I think that a transatlantic uh, alliance of democratic nations can only function if the main shareholder, meaning the US, thinks that the European partners are relevant, and if the smaller shareholders together think that they matter in Washington and have influence. Because if they don't have influence, they will be frustrated and become anti-American. Mm -hmm. If the Americans don't think the Europeans are relevant, they will think they can do it alone. And there was a period when an American defense minister said, Germans are no longer relevant. And there are three countries not being aligned with the US, Cuba, Syria, and Germany. <laughs> this was a Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very outspoken because he had a German heritage. <laughs> and <laughs> therefore, he said it in such a blunt way. I think this mood has changed in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Germany, anyhow, there may a lot of, there's a lot of skepticism about the concrete, this specific administration. But I think most Germans agree that Europe should uh, be a, a close partner to the US, not always say yes. Mm -hmm. but be a relevant partner for the U.S. who sometimes disagrees, sometimes tries to influence the U.S., but anyhow that we are a partner of the U.S. Mm. Um, getting back to some of, those, some of those tensions, then 2003 was a very touchy moment there, both domestically mm. and uh, in terms of the relationships between the United States and Germany. I mean, you were right in the, you, you would have been right in the middle of this kind of thing, and mm -hmm. I know you, were, you mentioned at times that, you know, you think that Merkel would have had to do basically, you know, Merkel would have, basically it seems like you were saying would have towed the same sort of line. I mean, how did you, uh, I mean, what was your take on that whole, that period there where it looked like Schroeder was saying one thing domestically and it wasn't clear what he was saying to say the United States, uh, in, you know, back channels. I mean, uh, how were you negotiating that in terms of back and forth and things there like was, that? There uh, was uh, one signal which we at that time wanted to send that the German position was a no against the Iraq war but not a no against, in the war, as the Americans would describe it, mm -hmm. against terror. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we committed ourselves to send troops to Afghanistan for the first time, so far away. Several thousand German troops were there. And uh, we thought that the Iraq war had nothing to do with the war against terror, because uh, Saddam Hussein was a bastard, but he was not linked to al-Qaeda. And uh, our fear was that as a result of the war, there might be more terrorist attacks. And that the war against Iraq was not part of the war against terror, but might provoke more terrorists. Anyhow, and this was very difficult to explain at that time because the American administration explained this war in, first in terms of a campaign against weapons of mass destruction and secondly as a war against terror. So the impression which many Americans had at that time that was that our promise to be active in solidarity, in our solidarity against, in the campaign against international terrorism, we were not really living up to our promises. Mm. 
because they thought then we should have joined the war against Iraq as well. So this was a very, very difficult time at that time. But what I also at that time gave a message, which many Americans uh, didn't understand at that time, we have, as a result of World War II, a paragraph in our an article, in our constitution, which says that any government taking part in the preparation of an illegal war could be put on trial. So if we would have taken the definition of uh, Kofi Annan, of that war against in Iraq, it would have been not a legitimate and legal war. And therefore, always when I was asked, I was said, the legal interpretation of the war is highly nuanced, very controversial. Why that? Because otherwise we could not have allowed the Americans to use the bases in Germany. Mm. We could not have given them the right to send, to have overflight rights. And 8,000 German soldiers were protecting American garrisons. So why we gave the message that we were against this specific war, we at the same time gave the message that we wanted to limit the conflict to this specific conflict on Iraq. If we would have said to the US, you can't use the bases, you don't have overflight rights, then we would have provoked our relationship far beyond this specific conflict. And uh, most of my uh, counterparts in Washington at that time took the decision of the German government that they could use the bases and having overflight rights such, it's so much as a given that they could, they did not understand the message which was part of this decision. Because they, it, 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 the decision was, yes, we have a different view on Iraq, but we want to continue with our relationship. We have this conflict about this issue, but we don't want to change our alliance. And we don't want to have a permanent conflict inside the alliance. It's a conflict about this specific subject. This took me a long, long time to make that understood in, in, with, my, in, with my counterparts in, in Washington because the legal background and legal consideration naturally could not be explained at that time in public for obvious reasons. Mm. Uh, well, the, you know, there's also, I mean, there's, it's not just those kinds of flights, but there's the Al Masri affair and things like that. Yes. I mean, I know in Germany there's been a lot of heat about that, these CIA flights and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but this it's, is... I mean, this is, there you have to make a distinction between uh, this was a committee in the European Parliament mm -hmm. who was analyzing this, uh, these CIA flights. I think this was less of a debate in political circles inside Germany. Mm, all right, okay. I mean, those prisoners who were in Guantanamo, this was an issue. Mm -hmm. The CIA flights, I think, were less of, a, of concern mm. and of a, were less controversial. Mm. We didn't know what was going on, but everybody knew that something might have gone on. <laughs> well, then, uh, to get to the Middle East, since we're already kind of headed there, um, you've, you've also been giving some talks about the challenges of the Middle East for both the United States yeah. and Germany, and what you think Germany's role in that is. What do you think Germany's role is in, say, Middle Eastern relations in general, both with the United States and with the EU? Um, there's a certain irony in the situation now that Germany is the country which, after the United States, is closest to Israel. I mean, there's no other country of the major players in Europe which is so close to Israel as Germany is. And nowadays, about 75% of Israelis want a stronger German role, especially in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Not as a substitute for the US, but they trust the Germans more than some other European nations. This is a big, big change. And this has to do with also with exchange, and part of my job is also exchange programs. Uh, there is, because of our history, there is such an amount of work, political effort going on between Israel and Germany in terms of exchange programs. Mm -hmm. Youth exchange. I was first time in Israel in 1970, before I ever was in the United States. And at that time, I was, uh, had contact with the Social Democratic Youth Organization, Merat Hatzerah, and naturally, my contacts were not about only history, but we were conspiring against our respective leaderships as youngsters at that time. And this is how trust evolves over time. And I think this has been a stable relationship over a long period of time. And what is the difference between Germany and a couple of other European countries is that if in Germany we have a debate about, how, about the policy of Israel, then normally somebody stands up also to defend Israel, others defend the Palestinians, 
But then the one normally would not be a Jew, but somebody who has been in ESO last week as a result of the contact. In many other European countries, normally that one would be a Jew mm -hmm. in France and Britain. In Germany, we have a lot of church contacts, youth exchange contacts. And this changes, uh, we have also anti-Semitism in natural in Germany, as in most other European countries and even the US. But if you appeal to these sentiments, you, you lose in Germany, mm -hmm. the political campaign. There were people who tried it in a certain way, and they lost it, the debate. And I think this is, uh, is a very important factor in, we have good contacts with the Arab world. We, we are not part of the security equation in that region, if I leave the German troops offshore of Lebanon aside. Uh, but we, in a certain way, uh, might be even because we are not a military power so much as the US is in that region, uh, for us it's sometimes easier to talk with the Arab world than for the Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the Americans are needed as a power by the Arabs there, uh, uh, but we, Germany has never been a colonial power in that region, unlike Britain and France. So for strange reason, for us, uh, in, in spite of our good contacts uh, with Israel, uh, we never had a negative relationship with most of the Arab countries. We have an excellent relationship with that. And this is sometimes used now by the Americans, and it's appreciated by the Americans. And so far, our contact with the Americans about Middle East policy are very close, very intensive. And I think few people in the United States, States on, uh, know in, uh, very much how active Germany is in that field. Hmm. Is that something that is, if anything, increasing now with the change, as you say, in the Defense Department? and? Uh, you know, with uh, maybe Condoleezza Rice now having a little more influence, softening things up there. I mean, are they using Germany and other EU countries as sort of back channels in Iran and places like that? I would not say that they are using it, but the, there is a close cooperation between the United States and us on these issues. By the way, the, this, and so far as Iran is concerned, to, uh, uh, this was already a meeting uh, uh, between Schroeder and President Bush when they met in Mainz. Yeah that they agreed upon that one should cons uh, consult with one another about, uh, about Iranian policies. And uh, since then, it has been, uh, uh, has been achieved to a very high degree. I always feared that Europeans and the United States might drift apart on the Iranian issue. For the time being, we are cl cooperating closely with one another. And uh, we like the Iranians, the Germans, but we dislike the present leadership. Oh. And uh, we think that with their remarks, not only nuclear weapons, but also on Israel, they have crossed a red line, so to say. So we are totally in consensus with the United States about the political goals. We might not always agree on tactics, but on the goals, we are very much identical. So what was the German take on this whole uh, British uh, capture thing there? I mean, total solidarity with the British. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, one question I, I want to start talking about is the EU and Germany in the EU and prospects for the EU. Um, I mean, Germany now holds the presidency, right, for six months. Um, what do you see, I mean, the Constitution was not a, a success, um, and I know that Merkel is trying to revitalize that. What do you see the prospects there? I mean, it's a historical process. We, are, we have achieved a situation in 50 years that the war between major nations in Europe are, is unthinkable. We have now enlarged this area of peace to the East by including the East European neighbors into the European Union. This is when you take the two, last 2,000 years of European history into consideration is a major achievement in a relatively short period of 50 years. Now we are talking about the export of stability, not the, about the internal stability, but to export peace and security and stability by the European Union to the outside. And this goes to the core of the understanding of national sovereignty. There are you, all the nations with their different memories about national identity, historical memory of the Poles is by definition different from that of the Germans. The British have there on the historic understanding how they define the role of their nation. The French have their specific role. And this takes time. And uh, 
I would not say that uh, we have the time, but we need the time. And the next step will be not a real united Europe as I want it. But it will be, in all likelihood, a Europe which can manage uh, a coherent action, not only in the domestic economic market, but also in the external power, uh, in the external power, in the uh, policy, to a higher degree than at present time. It will not be an integrated foreign policy yet. It will be a coordinated foreign policy with some aspects of integration. For example, we have now in headquarter in Szczecin, former Stettin, which is now Polish, earlier on prior until 45 was uh, German. You have now there a German Polish, the headquarter of a German Polish Danish brigade. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something uh, which you could not think of. And if German soldiers in German uniforms are now you know, walking around in Stettin, the only problem which they might have is uh, the same problem which Polish soldiers of that age might have with the young girls as well. <laughs> so there is not a national bias mm -hmm. uh, in so far as this is concerned. And uh, I mean, this is moving in the right direction. And, uh, but it takes time. And I think the idea of the present German government of Angela Merkel is uh, to define the criteria and uh, certain dates for the future process in which not a convention, but a type of new treaty might be formulated, which makes the cohesion in the European Union greater. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very difficult to describe this process uh, to the American audience, because in some areas, this European Union is like a treaty between sovereign states. In other areas, you have a European court, which acts like the federal court, Supreme Court, and is supranational. And the decision of this federal court has, they need, are implemented by national governments. So overrule national courts. So you have, their national sovereignty is no longer the primary aspect of uh, European identity. So you have this in between. It's not, Europe is not a nation state, uh, but it's more than an international treaty based organization. It's something in between. And uh, it's also changing over time. And uh, we Germans have want more integration. Because why? There's a deep, deep historical uh, motivation behind that. Uh, Europe has for centuries, since this 17th century, 16th century, has been dominated by a balance of power concept. And the result of the balance of power concept was more or less that there was less balance but more power and a lot of wars between major European countries. And therefore, because the one nation formed a coalition with the other one, and we wanted such a network of relationship with, within the, between European nations so that the likelihood of any nations to form an alliance against others was no longer there. I mean, now the Poles sit on the same board in the European Commission with Germany and France. And we make decisions on that subject with the votes in Poles, French, Germans on one side, and the next decision there will be a different vote. But we don't have a, an alliance, a permanent alliance, where major neighbors of Germany try to balance Germany's influence by forming a counter-alliance, a balancing alliance against Germany, or the other side, the other aspect is that they fear these smaller nations, that Germany would be so strong that they could dominate their policies. No individual nation in Europe is strong enough to, to matter alone inside Europe. Even France and Germany together cannot manipulate Europe anymore because after the enlargement process. It already has too many uh, members. The bigger nations have to take the interest of smaller nations into consideration, otherwise they can't get a majority. And I think this is very healthy for the stability in the European concept of powers, and it's much more stable than the traditional concept of powers. That's why we, you have so many neighbors, and either have been perceived by them as a threat, or we have perceived them as a threat of encirclement for other periods of German history. Therefore, this asymmetry, which was always at the core of conflict between European powers, 
it's to avoid that repetition of that is for us a core instinct. And you have seen elements of that reviving during the German unification process. Mm -hmm. There, Thatcher and Mitterrand were going to Kiev, talking with the Russians, and the one power who balanced these three was the United States, who was at that time more optimistic about German unification than most of our European neighbors. And, but we saw the revival of this balance of power concept actually during the process of Euro European unification. And this was one of the reasons why we gave up the German mark, created the euro zone, and were in favor of more integration to avoid especially that to happen. Mm. Well, you've kind of hinted at some, it sounds like you have maybe a stronger, uh, stronger affinity for more unity than you see coming. I mean, what's your vision? I mean, if you can speak, you know off the record here, uh, you know, what's, what, would your, what would your vision of a, you know, the new Europe be? I think that uh, uh, I could very much live with a Europe which is based on nation states, but where the nation states have such a relationship with one another that they practically form a new identity, which uh, doesn't mean to give up the nations as such, but where you have a, not only a common internal market, but where we also have a, a common defense policy mm -hmm. and a common foreign policy. I would go as far and I would like even a European army. Mm -hmm. But this is much more than our neighbors want at this time, so I need more time. <laughs> and what about Turkey? I mean, uh, there's some issues, I mean, about Turkey joining the EU. I mean, do you think the EU is, that vision of the EU is broad enough to encompass countries as far away as, you know, culturally and linguistically everything Turkey? Yes, this is divisive inside Europe. This is divisive inside Germany. The Social Democrats are more in favor. The Christian Democrats are more against. But there, are, some people emphasize the strategic implications. The strategic implication is that if Turkey is member, we would uh, have a democratic Turkey. For otherwise, they could not join. Mm -hmm. This is a precondition that they are fully democratic, living up to all the criteria, which they are not yet. Uh, that then they could join, but the other problem is, and others emphasize that, then you automatically have a f sooner or later a free labor market. Mm -hmm. And I have heard very few Americans who endorsed the uh, Turkey naturally as a full member of the European Union who uh, endorsed the free labor market with Mexico. And therefore, these domestic implications uh, are obviously there. And this, uh, these are cultural implications, but also other implications because. It's a fast-growing population. The living standards is much, much lower than in most other European countries. And uh, the uh, difficulties to integrate those people, and I live in such an area in Berlin, uh, with the high uh, about 50% of the children in schools have a Muslim background, it's easier to be in favor of integration than to practice it. And uh, uh, because then you have uh, these problems, so these people are not coming from Istanbul, they're not coming from Ankara. You, they are coming from Anatolia. And uh, a relative high percentage of those people have managed marriages, uh, which is illegal in Turkey, but it's a practice which they bring to Germany. Uh, the Turks sitting in Istanbul and Ankara against fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists, but those in Anatolia are to a certain degree fundamentalists, they bring it into our country. And as a reaction against a strange environment, sometimes they are more fundamentalists and more nationalists than they would be at home. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there are day-to-day -day problem, and, um, and uh, then there are language problem. I have a nine-year-old son. He is playing in the, my neighborhood with the Turks, but he sometimes complains that these Turks are very violent. Why? If you can't speak German, then the language is body language, and body language is obviously another expression of being violent. And uh, therefore, I'm saying, see, my party, the SPD, is in, pr in principle in favor of Turkish membership, but I must say it's easier to be in favor than to, uh, to practically live up to all those conditions which later on will not lead to a failure of such a membership, which leads, then would lead to a greater uh, understanding, a better understanding between Turks and Germans and not the other way around. Mm. Well, in this mod, in this sort of gr in this grander Europe, I mean, what do you envision as the conditions uh, before you know, let's say, the EU will take on a new member? I mean, is it geographic? Is it you know? I mean, uh, uh, what are gonna what's gonna count as a boundary here? I mean, you say, look, okay, Turkey, yes, Lebanon, no. 
You know, I mean, uh, definitely Lebanon, no. <laughs> and uh, Turkey is controversial. I don't see it in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. because if you would have a popular vote in France, they would be against. In Germany, it would be easier, interesting enough, that most Frenchmen see it, Turkey, with the eyes of the Arab population. Mm -hmm. And they, you know this, they have that problem. And why we have a lot of problems with those with Turkish background in Germany, uh, we don't have the identical problem with the French have in the banlieue. I mean, it's strangely enough, uh, but uh, we don't have, the, we have ghettos, but not to the same degree in the area. The typical thing is I live in a heavily populated, uh, an area being populated by many Turks. But I don't know of any French politician with such a background like me living in the banlieue. And in and, and Kreuzberg and Berlin and in other parts of Berlin, there are a lot of Turks living, but at the same time, there are a lot of students living there. And a lot of other Germans are living there. Not only those with Turkish background, but also other Germans. Mm. So it's more mixed. But having said that, if I leave the Turkish aspect aside, the European Parliament needs to say yes for future enlargement. This Just is as a sort of pro forma thing. It's not pro forma. Mm. And there is definitely uh, uh, a mood in the European Parliament not to say yes to future enlargements, even if I leave Turkey aside, uh, unless you get a deepening of the European process, meaning mm. a, getting a type of European agreement, convention, or whatever you might call it. Mm. And the first one who might suffer from that might not be Turkey, because this is much, much later. It might be Croatia. Mm. Uh, Croatia has be, uh, already had gotten the promise to, that it can become a member privileged member, like the other Balkan states, once they live up to the conditions, the so-called Copenhagen criteria. But uh, the, the mood in the European Parliament is, for the time being, after the failure of the convention of such a nature, that there is a reluctance to enlarge further. Mm. And Croatia is not big. It's, it's, there's no doubt that this Croatia is part of Europe. But you see it already there, that there's a big, uh, big change of the mood so far as uh, enlargement is concerned. You see it, by the way, not only in France. Uh, Britain, when Poland became member of the European Union, uh, uh, the British gave the Poles immediate free access to the labor market. And they used it to such an extent. We didn't do it. We had a transition period of, I think, seven or nine years. I don't know the exact numbers. But anyhow, uh, the British said we are much more liberal. But then so many Poles came that now the mood in the country was, which by the way was for, to the benefit of the country, in my view, but then now when Romania and Bulgaria joined, the British applied the same rules as the Germans did with the Poles. So there is a certain degree of, uh, yes, there is, immigration is needed, but you, it's like in your country. Uh, it's needed, but objectively it's needed at the same time when you can't integrate it to a certain degree, you get counter-reaction in the political body, in the population, and then you get a lot of controversy, how much you can take, how much you can integrate. And this is what we see now in different European countries evolving. Mm. Therefore, I think the mood in favor of enlargement after the big steps of enlargement is going now more in the negative direction. I hope this will not be on a, 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 the mood on permanent basis. I hope that we will have future enlargement. But uh, if I, the real controversial issues are not about the Balkans, the real controversials are about Turkey and about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And for these two countries, one is controversial, the others I don't see the perspective yet. Mm. Um, I want to turn a little farther east, going a little farther east, and uh, China. Um, uh, they will not become member of the European Union. No, I, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. But, you know, I mean, in the United States, as you well know, right, the talk is China, 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 right? I mean, in the 80s it was Japan, and yeah. now it's China. And, you know, I mean, it, you know, ever since Napoleon, people have been predicting that China is going to become the dominant power of the world. But now it looks like, you know, I mean, it looks a little realer. Um, what do you view Germany's role vis-a-vis -vis China? I mean, in terms of opportunities, economic opportunities, and then also the EU and China. I mean, I this is where well, the Americans, in my view, have the tendency to uh, to to balance between challenge and risk. And the Germans have the tendency to see it between challenge and opportunity. Why that? First of all, we have an Im our trade is not balanced with China, but it's much more balanced than your trade, which is not difficult, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
Then, secondly, during the Cold War, China was a balancing power against the Soviet Union. China was in favor of German unification, more than most of our European allies. China was always in favor of a strong European Union, sometimes even more than the United States. And we were never part of the security equation in Asia. We were not taking part in the Korea War. We have no security commitments for Taiwan. And we were not part of the Vietnam War. And therefore, Germans might underestimate the security risk which China is posing. And I think we need, as Germans, to understand more why the Americans are so concerned. But with that background which I described, the spontaneous uh, assessment of most Germans is to think more about opportunities mm -hmm. than to think about risks. Sometimes as a challenge, because of uh, they have sometimes a tendency to steal certain mm -hmm. knowledge. <laughs> I mean, but it's, uh, the debate, for obvious reasons, is, is different in the United States than it is in Germany. And now the American administration tries to engage us also in their security concerns. And I think we are starting to think about it, because for, in the past we were not part of that debate inside the West, because this was a European debate, which was more economic orientated, and a US debate, which was economic orientated and security orientated. Mm -hmm. This is not changing in Germany. Okay, I think I'll uh, just have one more question then we'll uh, open it up. Um, you know, uh, just as a sort of personal uh, aside, uh, I have a personal tie to Germany in that I was born there. And uh, my mother is uh, actually an emigre from uh, Romania. And one of the things, I mean, you've touched on this with sort of cultural exchange with Israel and Germany. One of the things that it seems historically has been a kind of cultural tie between the United States and Germany is a sort of common ancestry. I mean, a lot of people could trace, you know, not too many generations in the past. Whereas I'm wondering if today, especially with the changes in the United States in terms of immigration and things like that, whether you get any sense at all that you feel that the United States is in a sense losing some of its cultural connections to Europe, or not, maybe not losing them, but these are becoming more attenuated as the United States is turning more, both not just about policy and things, but maybe even culturally and familial ties and things to places like the Far East, Latin America, Central America. Is that? Is there, is there a sense of that in, in Europe that the United States is becoming a little less European? The Germany is also changing ethnically. Mm. One should not forget that. Not only the US is changing, Germany is also changing. And uh, the geostrategic condition of the Cold War cannot be revived and should not be revived. And so far, there is a different relationship. Uh, but at the same time, the challenge which, challenges which we are facing, Islamic fundamentalism and extremism, terrorism, global warming, HIV, internet, international diseases, these are common challenges. And no individual nation can solve them alone. And my basic concept is always that if the United States and Europe are working together, we cannot guarantee that these problems are solved. But if we are working against one another, we can guarantee that they'll not be solved. And therefore, the transatlantic cooperation is a necessary but not always sufficient precondition, to use a philosophical <laughs> definition, is, uh, is necessary but not always sufficient precondition for global stability. We need to engage other nations, other uh, partners, but when we look, compare our identity with that of other regions of the world, we are different, but we have more in common than we have with other regions. And therefore, I take this as a bipolar system, the transatlantic community, not with equidistance to other regions, mm -hmm. China, but as one system, a security community, a community of democracies, with two poles, a European and an American pole. And then what Germans and Americans have in common is also it's sometimes making it easier to just discuss with one another. Sometimes it makes it more difficult. We have a tendency 
to explain our international policies, not only in terms of interest, but also in terms of values. Not prestige. <laughs> That's a different nation. But we have the tendency to be very moralistic. And therefore, if we agree, it's fine. If we disagree, we very often have the tendency to question the moral assumptions of the other side. Uh, when I, during the Iraq war, I very often was confronted with the view that uh, we were leaving you alone. Germans, I hear that even in Washington, that Germans have always been unclear in the fight against dictatorships. <laughs> Therefore, one could not trust them that to kick out another dictator. So it was very clear speech. But on the other side, the same is happening on the German side as well. If we disagree with the Americans, we are very emotional. And that is, is a typical expression of a type of family relationship. If you quarrel inside a family, the debate is always more heated and more emotional than, in, than uh, compared with the discussion with people to whom you don't relate uh, in a personal way. And this is Germans and Americans have a type of family relationship with one another, for the better and for the worse. Uh, in a certain way, we are the Saulus who became a Paulus <laughs> as a result of your engagement after World War II. There is a lot of strong German heritage in US politics, starting with Eisenhower and Kissinger, Blumenthal, mm -hmm. and many others. And you discover it here and there. And there are many people in whom I met in Europe, in France, and in Italy who are saying that in terms of this moralistic attitudes towards international relations, that this is something which Americans and Germans have very much in common, which sometimes, again, as I'm saying, makes our relationship easier, sometimes makes it more complicated, but it makes it always very special. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much.